Say goodbye to your credit card rewards. Greedy corporate mega stores, led by Walmart and Target, are pushing for a law in Congress to take away your hard-earned cash back and travel points to line their pockets. The Durbin Marshall Credit Card Bill would enact harmful credit card routing mandates that would end credit card rewards as we know it. If you love your credit card rewards, tell your lawmakers, hands off my rewards. Tell them to oppose the Durbin Marshall Credit Card Bill. This week's podcast is brought to you by Mack Weldon. They make comfortable, high-quality, high-performing underwear, socks, and shirts. They sent me some samples, and they were indeed excellent, and even have a handy note stitched in saying that they're for daily wear. They want you to be comfortable, so if you don't like your first pair, you can keep it, and they will still refund you, no questions asked. So for great underwear, socks, and shirts that look good and perform well while working out, going to work, going out on dates, and in everyday life, go to MacWeldon.com and get 20% off using promo code STORIES. That's MacWeldon.com. A science story, huh? And I, looking back on this, really right. strange. So and I feel like it was that golden moment. Because science was on my side. Hi everyone, I'm Ben Lilly, and welcome to the Story Collider, where we bring you true personal stories about science. This week's story is from David Putrino. It was recorded in March 2015 at Littlefield in Brooklyn as part of Brain Awareness Week. Um, so, yeah, I, I guess I'll start out by saying that I was a really, really clumsy child when I was growing up. I'm, I'm the kind of kid that, like, everybody who has is having kids or thinking about having kids wishes that this is not their kid, you know, like I would, you know, if you put me in a ball pit, I'd get stitches. You put me in a bouncy castle, I'd get stitches. Get me in a knife fight. Yeah, well, I didn't say I was boring. I just said, you know, stitches. Um, and I had like a really long history at the, the hospital. The, I grew up in Perth, Western Australia, and then the, there's one children's hospital there. And, and uh, I was pretty well known. I, I was so well known that this uh, one time, it was like 9 p.m. in the evening, and uh, my mum is sort of in very panicked tones trying to explain to them how I got needed 16 stitches for, from a visit to the library. And uh, <laughs> they, uh, they, they took my mum aside and they, they, they put her in a little room and they said, so David hurts himself a lot. And, and they were, she was like, yeah, I know, it's crazy. He's always hurting himself. And they're like, yeah, how does that make you feel? Do you, do you get angry? Oh, I want to smack him. So <laughs> mum stayed in the room for a while. Uh, until they slowly worked out that, no, it was really me. Um, I, did, I did get 16 stitches on my head because I was trying to climb to the top of the shelves and, you know. So, you know, at least, you know, there's silver lining. So I, I got to spend a lot of time in hospitals. I got to actually, you know, who knows why, but maybe it was Stockholm Syndrome, maybe it was something else, but I started to like hospitals. I started to enjoy the workflow and like how everyone was busy and had a sense of purpose, you know. And... <laughs> I was like, come on. And I was just like, well, maybe this is what I want to do. I want to work in the health profession. I still remember I was like about 15. I was in hospital for around a month or so with a shattered tibia and fibula from playing Australian football. For those of you who are not familiar, it's it's a lot like Game of Thrones, but less sex, more violence. Still a little sexy, but but pretty violent. Um, and I was laying there and I, I remember sort of taking an inventory of, of everyone who was working and I was like, well, the doctors are no good because they they run in, they run out, they sort of write a thing down and, and I don't see them for a week and, and that's not what I'm into. And, and the nurses, you know, they're, they're great and all, but, you know, they've also got to clean up poo, so I don't want to do that. And, and then I was looking at the physical therapist and I was like, okay, well, this, this person is working with me. I'm getting better and, and, and my own physical therapist, I had a really nasty break and, and so for the first time when I walked after the, the broken leg, she actually burst into tears and I was like, wow, that's, you know, that's salient, that's something I really want to do. Uh, so, you know, that was when I decided I'll, I'll go into physio school and I'll, I'll learn about all of this stuff and, and um, it was interesting because I was about 
two years into uh, my schooling and um, I got placed in the hospital that I frequented a lot, Princess Margaret Hospital. I was sitting there and I basically did, I was bored one afternoon, I did the health professional version of Googling yourself. I just sort of went, I'm going to look at my medical record. And uh, at that point, I, I, you know, got to see this expansive document um, of really stupid things. Like the histories were, were quite something, you know, like patient was halfway up a tree and decided to chase after a cat and, you know, but there was uh, the first entry was something that, you know, really shocked me because um, my, my mum had always alluded to something terrible that had happened when I was very, very young and I was like, well, pick it, you know, there was the one where I was dragged by a car, there was, you know, and, but, <laughs> yeah, um, but when I was 18 months old, uh, there, was a, there was an incident that happened, <clears throat> and it turns out my, uh, my brain was uh, deprived of oxygen for about six minutes, and I remember, it was really funny because I remember just reading through the, the, the record and, and looking at the language and being trained as a health professional, reading the language that was being used, I, automatically my brain couldn't help go, oh, God, this person is fucked. Like, you know, this, <laughs> they're, they're not going to be any good anymore. And, and, you know, they were talking about dense hemiplegia, which means the left side of the, the, the one side of the body is just not moving and not working. And they were talking about prognosis. Uh, we'll, we'll never be independent with ambulation, so we'll never walk again. Um, we'll, we'll never be functional with the left hand. And I was like, okay, well, that's, that's pretty dire. So I went home. I was living with my parents at the time because in uh, your final year of physio school, you're basically a... Um, you're not getting paid anything, but you're working full time. So the ceiling of the house I was renting had collapsed and they gave me the choice of living at home or, uh, you know, living in the collapsed ceiling place. And I was like, well, I heard asbestos is pretty bad, but <laughs> so is living with my parents. So it was a tough choice, but I live with my parents anyway. <laughs> so I, I got home and I was like, okay, mum, uh, I read something today and I don't want you to freak out, but can you tell me a little bit about why um, it said in my medical records that I shouldn't be able to walk or move? And she was like, oh yeah, yeah, that thing. So it turns out I was 18 months old and um, I had this uh, thing called a febrile seizure, which is um, when uh, you, you have a seizure uh, which is accompanied with a, t a high temperature. It scares the hell out of your parents, but ordinarily um, it doesn't actually do anything to the kid. It's just scary as hell, and then they go back to being kids. Um, I think, you know, as we've, as we've established, I have really good luck with my health. So I had a seizure. I stopped breathing. Uh, it was three in the morning. My mum, maybe she was awoken by the commotion from the seizure, walks over to me, sees her kid laying there, blue in the face, freaks out. Um, screams at my dad, my God, David's blue, David's blue. My father, fantastic man. Uh, my mum can be a little histrionic at times. And my dad is like, wakes up, three o'clock in the morning. He's not blue, go back to sleep. Rolls back over. My mum starts screaming, drags me into the car. The neighbour the neighbor wakes up from all the commotion, drives to the hospital. I'm resuscitated. Um, and this is the point where the prognosis is given. This is the point where the doctor is like, okay, look at him. He's paralyzed, definitely paralyzed. He'll never walk again. He's, you, you've got to put him in an assistive care facility. That's it. And so you've got this guy in a white coat, you know, at least 10 years of medical schooling under his belt. And he's telling these people with a lot of certainty, you know, like balls on this guy. You know, he's really, you know, uh, this guy is never going to walk again. He's never going to move again. And my parents, my parents, on the, you know, by contrast, uh, if you haven't already noticed by what's going on here, uh, both of them were born in Italy and uh, both of them had <laughs> migrated to Australia. Between them, they had about, uh, you know, 13 years of primary schooling, you know, uh, grade schooling uh, under their belt. And they looked at my prognosis and they said, no, nope. they sat me down and they forced me to attend to my left side. Everything that happened, happened on my left side. So if I had to eat, the food was on my left side. If I had to, you know, play with my toys, it was all on my left. And uh, sure enough, things started to return. Um, things aren't quite back to normal. If we, if we play some music, we, we, you know, we can see where, where, the, where the wheels start falling off. I can assure you of that. But, uh, <laughs> um, but the point is that uh, things more or less recovered. And... Um, and, uh, you know, after that, I was hooked. That, that was my trajectory as a physical therapist. I was going to work with neurological disorders. And I started working in a stroke ward. And, um, you know, 
I, I thought, well, this is wonderful. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to... Um, you know, I'm going to change the world, and, and then you start actually working on the ward, and you start to realise how all the physical therapists and all the medical professionals are treating their patients. And uh, I remember, you know, I started to get a bit jaded, and then I had this one patient that she was a this sassy old Scottish lady. She was about 88, and she'd had a stroke, and she'd been in the hospital for about three months, um, and she uh, she had absolutely no movement whatsoever in her left left hand, and she was. She had been quite convinced, she had been told that it was going to stay that way. And they were just rapidly trying to get her out of the hospital because she couldn't walk yet, but she had to be able to walk to, to go home. So they were just, they said to me, don't worry about her hand, don't even focus on her hand, forget about her hand, just get her walking independently and then turf her, like get her out. And I was like, well, that, you know, no, uh, I, I'm going to do something for her hand. So I was chatting to her and I found out that she used to play the piano. So I said, well, you know what? Um, Rather than hiding your... She used to wear a glove over her hand. I said, take, take the glove off and for just, just 10 minutes a day, look at your hand and imagine that you're playing the piano. That's, that's all I want you to do. Don't do anything else. And within two weeks, she started flickering her hand. And within four weeks, she was moving functionally. And, and this does not end with playing piano. It's, that, that, that didn't happen. But, she, you know, she got function back. That's the main thing. She was able to actually do something with her hand after a little bit of, of just purely, you know, imaginary training. My senior therapist was pissed. She was like, I told you to stay away from the hand, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, well, I didn't do anything. You know, I just told her to think about moving, and this is what happened. And then we got in this giant argument about... Uh, whether it was the imaginary movements or what that made her feel better. And I remember having this very granulizing moment of, well, okay, so we get paid to treat people and we're arguing right now about why someone is getting better and no one can agree. And I was thinking, you know, if I was a mechanic and someone came with a car and they said, the car's not working, and I said, well, I'm going to do a bunch of stuff and there's a 20% chance that that shit will come back and otherwise uh, you still got to pay me <laughs> but but you know if it doesn't come back well who knows it's a mystery <laughs> you know um, so and i was like well that's actually kind of corrupt and not 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 good so you know i did what everyone does does when they have a crisis of faith i did a phd i was like <laughs> <laughs> i know <laughs> I'm going to solve the motor system with one PhD. I'm going to work it out. And so, uh, spoiler alert, did not work. One PhD, <laughs> not enough. Um, but at that point, it was pretty much hopeless for me. I got hooked. I, I uh, moved to the States. I finished my PhD, did a postdoc uh, with a great guy called Emery Brown in, in, in uh, Boston at MIT and Harvard and learned about neurostatistics and how we can play around with the nervous system. And then I moved to NYU and did a little bit of work training uh, monkeys to control brain-computer interfaces and prosthetic arms and things like that, just using their thoughts. And... Uh, and, and it was around that point where I had my, my secondary crisis of faith where my, like, my uh, clinician was getting antsy. And, and so I had to do something that was a bit more clinical. So I accepted this position now that I have where I, I build telemedicine systems, where I try to send out systems into the community that decrease social isolation and allow people to um, you know, learn about their body and learn about wellness as they're getting better and as they're performing their rehabilitation. And then that teaches us in turn about how to make people better over time. So that's basically my story. I don't really know, um, you know, I don't know that there's any one reason why I do what I do, but I can tell you that I, I'm pretty sure that I hope that some asshole in a white coat uh, doesn't show up and, and tell someone to lose hope. Uh, and I hope that that happens because of my, uh, my work. So thanks a lot, guys. That was David Putrino. David is a physical therapist with a PhD in neuroscience. He works to develop low-cost patient monitoring and treatment systems designed to decrease healthcare costs while improving the standard of patient care. This was produced as part of Brain Awareness Week. Our 2016 Brain Awareness Show is coming up March 15th. Tickets are on sale now. 
The Story Collider is produced by me, Brian Weck, Taryn Barker, Ari Daniel, Christine Gentry, Skylar Bear, and Liz Neely. The podcast is produced by Rose Eveleth. And just a lot from Brooke Williams, Lena Groger, and Justin D'Ambrosio. The theme music is by Ghost. Special thanks to Littlefield for hosting the show, to Heather McKellar, Heather Bowling, and everyone at Brain Awareness Week for being amazing partners, and to Brains for thinking. Thanks for listening. His karate lessons might not turn him into a black belt. Hi-ya! And even after band camp, he might not be the greatest musician. But with the 3% annual percentage yield you can earn on a PenFed premium online savings account, your goal of supporting his dreams... Thanks for everything, Mom and Dad. ...will always be worth it. Apply today at PenFed.org slash savings. Federally insured by NCUA. $5 minimum to open account. To receive any advertised product, you must become a member of PenFed. PenFed's got great rates for everyone.